Uh, I think we'll go ahead, we're just at one o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Typically, I, I would wander off from the microphone, but we're recording this, so must stay on point. Um, thank you all for coming uh, to, the, to, the, um, to this event uh, as a whole. Um, my name is Will Hoffman. I'm the Director of Conservation here at the museum. And what we're going to talk about today, we're going to try to cram into an hour, is um, we're going to do uh, a little bit of recovering briefly uh, um, about the um, artifact recovery of modern art, of artifacts for those who weren't at the lecture here earlier, and probably a more scope of what we're going to be talking about. But then we're really going to focus on establishing a conservation program here, and then we're going to focus on the conservation of the turret, the conservation of the propulsion engine, and sort of discuss some of the other artifacts um, in the collection throughout this lecture to try to give you all a comprehensive overview of monitor conservation to date and you know, why we're 20 years into the project and we're still not done. So, um, and then we'll sort of end by sort of giving some discussion on sort of next steps, sort of the future, where we're going, um, moving forward from 2022. So, as was discussed, monitor sank in a storm 16 nautical miles off of Cape Hatteras. I believe it's a long, skinny ship, turned in the middle. We believe it sank stern first. The ship turned over, uh, landed uh, upside down on top of it. The wreck was found in 1973, confirmed monitor in 1974. In 1975, it was designated as the first National Marine Sanctuary under National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, as John had mentioned this morning, uh, first dive goes on in 1977. Uh, the red signal lantern is recovered. Then in 1979, um, additional artifacts are recovered over 100. And then in 1983, the uh, anchor is recovered. In 1987, the uh, my, Mariners Museum and Park is designated as the principal repository for the curation and conservation of monitor artifacts. And so at that point, there wasn't any main plan to bring anything else up, but as once again as talked about earlier, uh, the ship is determined to be an advanced state of deterioration. And so a six phase recovery plan is, is devised with the ultimate goal of recovering monitors and most uh, signature artifacts, culminating with the recovery of the turret. And so er, their initial phases, are to shore the ship, and then it's to remove engineering section, to clear the way to remove the armor belt section, to free way for the turret. So in 1998, the turret is a uh, turret. In 1998, the, the propeller and first section 10 feet of propeller shaft is recovered. Um, in 2000, the um, additional shaft is recovered as well as the, uh, the stuffing box. In 2000, uh, also the skeg assembly is also recovered. So that includes um, the sort of the very end of the hull where the skeg attached. Here, the whole shaft, the whole skeg assembly to the back of the propeller. And then following that, that sets the stage for recovering the engineering section and lowering the barge structure, um, the, the, the bridge structure over it for the engineering section. and. It not only included the propulsion engine in this lift, but it also included all the bulkhead structure underneath the ship. And so that once that's removed, in addition to that material, you also have almost the rest of the engine room. So recovered was the propulsion engine, floor steps, railings, five of the ship's steam engines, the, uh, um, uh, the steam condenser, the main steam line, a, a slew of plumbing and other mechanical components all were raised and were sent to the museum. And so it is still, to our knowledge, the largest marine metals conservation um, effort recovery in the world. And we have the earliest and most complete steam engine room ever recovered, um, almost in its entirety. So all these materials are transferred to the Mariners Museum from the wreck site and a litany of different barges, trucks, all kinds of things transferred to land and then brought to the museum. And so for those who this is your first time, we've only been here in the last couple of years, we see this beautiful, fabulous facility that we have, which is the Batten Conservation Complex. It did not start out that way. Um, and that's because, as I said, as we think about the monitor project, we also have to think about the fact that 
so much of this has ne was never done, the scale of recovery, and that also has rolled into the conservation effort. So you have all these barges and trucks bringing artifacts in, and the museum is just figuring out what to do with them. What do we have? Where do they go? There isn't a laboratory. And so um, there, we're bringing in tanks and all kinds of stuff to house artifacts. And the important thing for this initial slide is it was known almost from day one that the public had to be engaged with it. There had to be an opportunity to see the experience. So even though these tanks are outside the elements for the first several years of the project, there is, uh, it's inherent in there that the people have to be engaged with it. But it still doesn't mean artifacts aren't housed in dumpsters, which are easily available. And uh, one of the stories is because they're in dumpsters, and you can see here there's a range of stuff. You've got some of the engine flooring, you've got the engine throttle, all kinds of plumbing assemblies, and all kinds of some of the steam engines. Um, there's a story of uh, caterers thinking the dumpsters for what they were. Um, their great excitement occurred when this little section of what was thought was a leather belt turned out to be a banana peel. <laughs> And so you're trying to, again, it's trying to put the frame of reference, it's really trying to figure out the conservation and how to care for it, where to put it all at the same time. And so there wasn't a designated lab. And so basically, wherever they could find space, artifacts were getting treated. And so, you know, work's happening out, out, out on the ocean, it's coming back to the museum. And so, um, a lot of tanks were re, uh, were um, were repurposed as said dumpsters, but obviously certain tanks and for the large artifacts were actually built at the museum. Um, and here you can see the the turret tank um, being constructed prior to the 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 lifting and the arrival of the turret. So as um, John had discussed earlier, um, to recover the turret. The spider assembly comes down, locks around the turret, basically that classic, like your arcade claw, we're trying to get your stuffed animal. In this case, they got it. Um, but all of the weight of the dog and guns, the carriages, the hundreds of artifacts, all the marine growth were sitting on the inside of the turret, which is upside down. And the roof of the turret, all on the roof, and the roof is held on by a retaining collar underneath the sockets for the canopy and so there's a concern that as they lifted it up this off the sea floor the uh, roof would just give out and they lose lose everything and so that's why they picked it up just a few feet off the sea floor and set it on the lower recovery structure and they sort of locked around it like an artifact oreo so that everything would be um would could be recovered and so we're going to get back to the talking about the lower recovery structure later in the presentation so then it too it's transferred um, to the museum by barge, it's done on the James River, transferred over to land, rolled up to the museum into its partially fabricated tank. So you can kind of see, here's a turret tank out in the elements. And so it's important to note that for the first few years, everyone is working outside year round. And that included the excavation work that John was relaying earlier on the interior. So all that work, initial stuff is happening outside. So in 2003, the spider is removed from the top of the turret. It is lifted up a little bit and uh, cribbing blocks are put underneath the turret to provide some access. Some parts of the lower recovery structure were cut out, but basically spider gone, turret is still sitting on the lower recovery structure at that point. And so by the time we get the following year, in 2004, you've got a pretty good view of the, uh, the bottom of the turret. So the, there would have been wood flooring that the ocean critter said delicious that used to be right here. And you can see the guns lying underneath their tracking inside the turret. So that to get the guns and the carriages out, the tracking had to be removed. And then the guns and carriages were lifted out in uh, September of 2004. So all outside. And so that led to building a new facility, the Monitor Center and the Batten Conservation Complex. So um, starting in uh, 2005. So here you can see sort of the, 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 um, art, the, the designer model. Here is the, the, the large artifact gallery. Here's the, the Virginia courtyard. And you can get an overview of the conservation facility, the wet lab, and then the upper labs and the classrooms upstairs. We'll also note that in this original design, there's a lot of tanks inside that space. And so that's going to become a challenge for us as well later on. But 
turret weighs 115 tons, um, and so it's going to be difficult to move a 115 ton object into the building. And so what had to happen first is a independent concrete pad had to be poured for the turret because not only you're holding the weight of the turret, but you're also holding the weight of the 90,000 gallons of water it's sitting in. So an independent pad is poured, a new tank bottom is installed, the tank in existing location is cut off at the base of it, at the base of the tank, it's lifted off, the turret is set onto flatbed, rolled over the new tank location, the tanks then reload around it. Rest of the lab floor is is installed and then the engine and the condenser first the condenser are then moved into their tanks and then um, once they're moved in so you can see here's the the engine being relocated from its initial tank to its existing tank that you now see in the laboratory they're moved into place and then the building is built around it and so again, important to note that while all of this movement and construction is happening, we're still having to advance the conservation. We're still having to figure out what we have, how we're going to conserve them. So it's, it's all these things that there's no time to do sequential or to really plan. You have to go with your knowledge at the time and kind of develop it because it's, it's happening so quickly. So by the time we get to 2007, um, the um, Minor Center opens, Ironclad Revolution exhibit opens, the Bat and Conservation Complex is completed, which includes the large wet, wet laboratory that you can see into, the upper clean laboratory you can see into, and a collection storage area for monitor artifacts. So by the time we get to this phase, we sort of shift focus, we can take a break, we can breathe, we can, can, so we've got the place established. And so we sort of start focusing on some of the machinery, the smaller components. So that includes two Worthington steam powered water pumps, which were used for auxiliary boiler feed. So when they came to the museum, they're covered in marine growth, which is a combination of cro corrosion, sediment, and marine life, which initially was alive, that at this point has, has now become deceased. And initially, apparently from what I've been told, had quite the smell. Um, and so that work happens. And again, on, in addition to removing the marine growth, you can't just start wailing at things with hammers and chisels because you don't know necessarily what's been below that marine growth. And so most of the time in conservation isn't actually doing the activity, it's doing the background planning and understanding what you have. So in the case of the pumps, we have some general idea from historical record how they're made, um, what they should look like, but the tools like x-rayography, doing exploratory cleaning gives an idea of what's underneath that because we, we really only get um, one shot at doing the work and we want to make sure that we get the best chance to do it right as possible. So we're decreting the, the pumps, also the two ventilation engines which were used, uh, blower engines which were used to force draft uh, the boilers. Those were cleaned and then we also began work during that time frame on the steam condenser of the ship. Now, one of our challenges in marine conservation is the fact that um, different material types need different ways to conserve them or different methodologies. So the method to conserve iron alloys is slightly different than copper alloys that's different than organic materials. And the methods to conserve the iron alloys will is detrimental, could either damage or destroy organic materials or cause um, really reversible damage. And so one of the decisions that we have to make is, do we try to treat the whole thing together or do we try to take it apart? We've made the decision to take artifacts in their individual component assemblies, treat them individually with the goal of reassembly post-conservation. So it's not always possible to do that, but it's, it's what we sort of strive to do. And also, especially with modern stuff that's big and heavy, it's much easier to turn pieces over than it is to turn a thing over as a whole assembly where you don't know if fasteners have survived and will it stay together, that kind of thing. And so just up here, you can kind of see some of the components, the condenser. This is the main body of the condenser, the bed plate for the condenser, and it had a boiler feed and a bilge pump on either side. So as steam came from the propulsion engine, some of it would be converted back to water and sent back to the boiler. Some of it would then be discharged out in the, into the ocean. So you can see these images, Here's deconcretion of it. Here's um, it cleaned of marine growth. And it's sort of hard to see with the light, but it would start to take it apart. Again, on the other side, we take off, we take also that time we take off the main manifold, which is um, the discharge manifold, which if you've ever seen the photograph of the moray eel sort of sticking its head out of the pipe, that's right out of here. 
We also, in this time period, focus on cleaning, finishing the clean next year, the guns. We also roll the gun carriages over, and we start this assembly of the port carriage, which is the one that's on display that you can go and see in the gallery. Um, so we're doing a lot of cleaning, but one of our big challenges is the removal of ocean salts. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but we really need a lot of pure water to do that. And you can produce it with little DI filters, like the ones at your house can do several hundred gallons, but how do you purify 90,000 gallons of water? It requires an industrial scale water system. And in 2011, we got a large reverse osmosis water system that can do about 90,000 gallons in four days. And so now we're really able to start the conservation of the artifacts. So, so although it's been here 20 years, really desalination for the big stuff hasn't started. We're only 10 years, a little more than 10 years in. And so that's why we largely left the propulsion engine covered in marine growth because we didn't want to expose it to more salts and, and we didn't want to um, start getting into cleaning it until we could put it into the desalination process. And so we start um, in, in um, and let me take it back, we got the Aero System 2010, sorry, 2011. Um, we start removing that marine growth. And so um, that starts out with big, heavy pneumatic tools, working your way down to dental tools. Um, it's slow process because you're really trying to break up this marine growth, but that's kind of tough to x-ray. It's so big. And so we're very fortunate. One of the things that we utilize a lot is um, period information. Now you always have to be careful, and we found it many, many times that just because it's an engineering drawing or a plan doesn't mean it's going to make it to the, the, to the the final object. And we found stuff that have been that has changed, and so that's where it monitor really is still a living archaeological project because we still learn stuff new um, every day. Because again, every time we take something apart, the last person who put those components on were the people that made it, and so you learn everything as you go. But we do have we do have information such as photographs from say class monitor original drawings, engravings that all give you an idea of what you're going to see. We also um, in, uh, resupport the whole engine assembly. It had been hanging from a large I-beam. It had come to the museum underneath sort of with this uh, strapped um, basket, which had been then replaced by an I-beam into the engine bed. Um, but that meant the engine was hanging, and so to make it safer to work on, we picked it up, set it on slightly, set it on pedestal stands, and removed that structure. So that allowed us to then go in and start disassembling in 2012, starting to take apart the reversing gear assembly bit by bit. And then the last thing we did uh, by the time we got to the end of 2012 is we started setting up the electric chemical system. We do a process called electrolytic, electrolytic reduction to extract ocean salts from the artifacts. And the reason why we do that is because um, ocean salts, so you leave your rake out, the type of rust that forms on your rake leaving in the rain is not very voluminous. It's not very expansive. It just rusts on the surface. But corrosion caused by ocean salts is very expansive. If you ever walked along the beach and seen something iron spalling apart on the ground, that's because of chloride. So what we want to do is we want to extract those chlorides as much as possible. And so what electrochemical process does is we basically cause the corrosion to chemically break down. And as it breaks down, it frees the ocean salts in the solution. So as we're taking them apart, as we're doing the electrochemical process, as we're doing cleaning, the amount of chloride in them starts up way high, gets lower and lower and lower until it reaches a point where we think they're finished, and that's when we dry them. So it's a very science-driven process. We actually have at the upper lab, we have a tool called an ion chromatograph that really allows us to track chloride levels to very, very low levels. And it's this ongoing process that we're continually doing. And so in this image also, over here, these are all the part of the bulkheads that the engine underneath the engine being treated in a separate tank. And so as, as John kind of quickly ran through earlier, this is what it looked like in 2010. And here we are in 2017, which is kind of still where we are today. And that's another challenge we often face is I'm unable to take this apart any, we're unable to take this apart any further because we don't have a spot to put the pieces in the lab at this point. We have to finish other things first, and so it very much is a living Jenga game. So moving on to the turret, 
Uh, there's a lot of work that happened that I kind of gleamed over a little bit. So when the turret first got here, um, uh, the NOAA and archaeologists excavate out the interior. And then um, following that, um, there's a phase to do some roof shoring in, in 07. And then we've really shifted focus until we get back into the, into the 2011. And what we're doing here is we're cleaning out some areas between the roof rails of the turret and we're cleaning what are called mantelets. We also call them nut guards. The turret is made of 100, over 190 plates, of, uh, over 190 plates of wrought iron. They're three feet by nine feet by one inch thick. The inner three layers are riveted and the rest are bolted together to form eight inches of iron. And so on the interior of the turret, you had all these rivet and bolt heads sticking out. And there was a concern that if an artillery projectile hit one of the fasteners on the outside it would drive the bolt in, cause the head to shear off and fly around and kill the gun crew. Like, you know, basically transferring energy when you crank, uh, crank on a baseball. And so they put these cover plates over those seams and we had to start excavating behind them because that's where marine growth got to. And so we started that work in 11. And as we're doing this work, cleaning those mantelets, removing, removing them, come across this. And you're like, what is that? And it turns out to be a spoon. And so it, the important thing is a reminder, because this, this, this belonged to a gentleman named Samuel Augie Lewis, third assistant engineer who died in the sinking. And so in this project, we're working on this big science, this big engineering. The turret's now just pretty much big metal shell, but we do continually get these little moments to remind us why this whole effort's happening, why we're doing it, is to tell the story of these individuals. And so you still get these things that pop up all the time. So, um, Within that same year, we do that. We set up an electrochemical system inside the uh, inside the turret and begin that phase of the project. And once again, we start shifting focus after that to other stuff. And so we have, um, if you notice, when I talk about earlier presentation, that image of the laboratory with all those tanks in it. Not a lot of space to work in there with all those tanks in the way. And that was had to do with planning and figuring stuff out. And so we quickly realized you can't fit it all in the wet lab. And so we have separate facilities, one on the back of the museum and one on the side that house more material for monitors. So that includes, um, we have recovered by the NOAA and the Navy is almost three complete sections of engine room diamond plate flooring. So two foot by three foot sections. Also, that we're also recovered or over 40 pipes from the engine room. So that's the main steam line from the from the boiler um, railings were all recovered um, as well as here's the, the bulkheads underneath the engine and then here's the skeg beam. So this is the, the very back part of the hull of the ship. This is the, where the uh, stuffing box is attached. All this is undergoing conservation, those facilities, which requires complete pivot of work away from everything in the lab to work outside to treat those. Because the, the general idea, we initially, a lot of projects do this, you try to write these super detailed work plans. We're gonna do this, 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 and this. And they quickly, one thing happens and pff, you're done. And so we've really shifted now for this project to really write tailored yearly plans around a specific part of the collection. So that way we can then pivot within a year um, if, if a change needs to happen, we kind of jump around the collection with the idea of advancing the whole thing at the same, relative same rate, because what's gonna end up happening is you're gonna have a whole bunch of stuff done way before a whole bunch of other stuff. So it really is a, a, a Jenga game, there's no other way to put it. So working all the material, we advanced the ball quite a bit on um, the Worthington pump. So if we go, if you remember that slide covering wing growth, here they are after conservation. So the other thing that we uh, that takes them say 20 years, why it takes so long is a lot of what we do in conservation the techniques and methods that we do here aren't necessarily new, but what you really have, what we really have to deal with a lot of the case, and this is with any archaeological project is no two archaeological sites are the same, no two type of burial environments are the same. You can have two objects that are almost identical, almost identical. One's buried here, one's buried here. This one's in perfect condition, almost coming up. This one's falling apart. Why is that? Who knows? Is it the alloy? It was this one came out of sand multiple times. Who knows? And so you really have to tailor everything to do to the needs of the artifacts of your collection. So in a case, especially of a scale of the monitor project, 
you know, you get presented a problem, a conservation challenge. And what do you do? You go, all right, the first thing you're going to do is we're going to look at the literature. We're going to figure out what other people did. We're going to understand what's been done before. You can say, ah, I got it all. And you sort of say, well, does this apply to the project that I'm working on? And in the rare case, maybe completely. And then you can sort of you do a little bit of testing. You ride, you ride that jam out. Other cases, you take the techniques that are out there, you try to apply to what you're doing, you're maybe 50%, and then you're modifying that technique to, to, to fix the problem that you're dealing with. And then obviously the third one is, no one's ever done this before in this way, and you have to develop a technique or a method or modify something to fit your technique, to fit your specific needs. And we, we kind of ride really between the second and the third in a lot of cases, and that boils down to scale um, and the size of the project. So for example, a lot of the treatment tanks we use, they may be like this big and you to make a, the sodium hydroxide solution, which we add, you may have to add a couple scoops from a bag to make that same volume to ratio rate solution from the turret tank. It's 7,500 pounds of caustic. It's 350 bag pallets. The, the science is exactly the same, but the scale is the thing that really sets the project apart. And so one of our challenges that that's been uh, that we, we had to deal with was wrought iron. So um, most um, of the iron that you see from modern, it kind of looks like wood. And that's because iron uh, is a, wrought iron is a forged material. Um, up until the mid 1860s, it's not till I think John, I heard John talking about it a little bit, up until the development of the Bessemer process, which happens in the later half of the 1860s, um, you could not produce um, very fine grain, low carbon metal. And so what you had to do is basically take a big cast iron ingot, heat it up, beat the daylights out of it, crush it, fold it, crush it, fold it, crush it, fold it. So you elongate octagonal iron grains to flat, as well as you push all the carbon from the foundry process out. And so what happens is when wrought iron's machined, it looks just like steel, but when it corrodes, it corrodes along where it's folded and moved. So as you can see here, this is that the, it's kind of hard to see with the light, but these are the structure of these lines and the challenge with wrought iron is corrosion gets way down into those pockets and it's very difficult to clean out. You can initially use old standby as dental tools. Somebody's in there cleaning all that corrosion out, but that's very time consuming. And how do you do that on a 22, 21 and a half foot turret in diameter, nine foot tall object? It's impractical. And so we're an industrial project. And so we looked to other places, we looked to other industries. And one of the things we developed on was the application of using dry ice. So what you end up doing is instead of using sand, walnut, shell, and other material, we actually use dry ice as, a, as the abrasive, fired out at high pressure, knocks the corrosion off, but it's soft enough not to affect the metal, and then it just sublimates the gas. We developed the technology to the museum, and um, we were able to acquire the equipment. So you can see that's before and after cleaning to remove embedded corrosion. And then here you can see it's applying it to the cleaning of the gun carriage. And you'll be able to see it knocking off a little bit of the, corro a little bit of the marine growth and corrosion in the wooded structure. You can see a few other objects. That's a sked beam. That's one of the diagonal turn buckles in the uh, in, from the turret. And so that technology uh, now that work, which is replacing mechanical hand cleaning in combination with electrochemistry, in combination with the desalination, is moving the ball for in the conservation. And so then by the time we get to 2016, we've shifted back to the turret and working on the turret. We're going to finish removing the nut guards on the interior, and we also get the opportunity in 2016 to have the turret laser scanned. So it's been laser scanned a couple times. We were able to laser scan it in 16. Now that it's been largely cleaned on its interior, and that enabled us to do this for the first time. So you can see all the, all the artillery dents from the battle with the Virginia and from Drury's Bluff. Imagine 19 guys in there and two guns. 
And so this information not only provides us an opportunity to be able to um, experience the turret, to be able to understand it visually from an archaeological standpoint, um, but it also able to start, start using that data to understand the um, archaeology of, the, of the, um, the structure. So we know that from the laser scan information, the turret's slightly out of round. We also know the roof has a huge bend on it on the port side, which helps give the indication that the turret slammed on the starboard side and flopped port because you can kind of, kind of see a waffle to it. So we're learning a whole bunch of stuff from the laser scan. We also learned that the um, electrochemical system we had wasn't as efficient as we wanted it to be. And so in 2016, we went in and we basically replaced the initial electrochemical system with this massive system. And so that, that's all stainless steel sheet, which is what's called the counter electrode that allows the electrochemical process to work. Um, but you're looking at $25,000 of 316 stainless on there. And it's expensive and it's costly, but again, it's the scale and it's the challenge that we always we're dealing with because you're again science physics same as the small scale, but applying it to the large scale and we just have to figure out pathways to be able to do that. So we get the turret set happy 16 set it back into its drink and once again we're shifting focus. And so one of the things we started working on and re engaging on is the middle section of the propeller shaft with the stuffing box, which is cast iron right here. So the stuffing box, for those who aren't familiar, it's basically that was the location where the propeller uh, shaft went from the interior of the ship to the exterior, and there's a packing material uh, uh, textile inside this chamber, and basically as you squeezed this flange against this, it would compress the packing against the inside of the chamber against the propeller shaft, basically creating a seal of the moisture. And that's de-alloyed cast iron. So um, cast iron, mixture of iron and carbon and what happens in the ocean, you get a process called galvanic corrosion, all the iron corrodes out and all you're left with is a carbon component. So it looks like the object has a shape of the object, but you go like this. And so that makes it difficult to take things apart, but it also presents a challenge to what happens if ocean salts and things get underneath it in that material. So we initially decided we weren't gonna attempt to take it apart, but as we were developing the application of dry blasting, we really found there were deep, deep pockets of corrosion in the surface. So we wanted to reevaluate taking it apart, initially starting with the separation of this coupling flange. And so our challenge, like so many that we have, is, as I was saying earlier, everything has to be custom done. You have to make your equipment to the needs of the object, and every time it has to be unique. And so one of the challenges of taking stuff apart is you got to be able to push on something, you got to be able to pull on something. And you got fragile materials, you can't, like, how do you direct the load? How do you direct the force? Where the energy is going? And so what we end up having to do is build machinery for each tailored to each object. And so in this case, we have to try to push the bolts that hold this flange together. We look at the nuts off, because in a lot of cases, seawater doesn't get in. As long as there's enough of the fastener head left, you can just unscrew it and just take the, head, take the fastener right off. But it's trying to get those bolts out. What do you push against? So we designed a machine that enabled us to direct 40 tons of hydraulic pressure on one bolt. And bit by bit, we were able to back them out. And we couldn't make them any, we couldn't make the system any Amazing. bigger because we were right up against the cast iron. And so there's also going to notice throughout this presentation, it's not one person, this entire thing, team. So you two people working together, one holding it and bit by bit, dag nab it, we got all those bolts out. And so that enables us to see this flange face and expose it for treatment, which is not only going to enable us to advance the treatment ball, but it's also going to enable us to make it easier to put it back together again in the exhibit. So pivoting again, it's the theme is the turret. So this is our best guess what the roof of the turret looks like. It consists of 14 plates of wrought iron. The central six are perforated. There's a retaining collar that runs all around the exterior edge. And then the canopy stanchion sockets that go around it hold that retaining collar on. And to be able to get access to the roof, um, the, one of the phases is going to be taking that roof assembly off. Unfortunately, 
up until 2019, it was sitting on the low recovery structure because it hadn't been a plan. It was to get it here, get started, but that's a down the line kind of thing. And so now we're faced, we can't turn the turret over till we take the roof off. We can't take the roof off till we get the recovery structure out of the way. And so it's lining up these steps. And so over the course of about eight years, working with um, multiple industrial partners, uh, with the main one being Newport New Shipbuilding, um, we designed, they designed pedestal stands working with um, Kalana Shipyard. They built the stands and then Newport, a fair lead painted them and then Newport News came back and installed them. And the plan basically, and I'll articulate this drawing, is each one of these green numbered shapes is a, is a 100 ton capacity bottle jack where you see in brown is a wooden cribbing that was there before. And then you can see the new stand locations here and enjoy. Technically, all three. So that's going to enable us to move to the next phase. Um, don't quite have a date yet. We'll talk a little bit later. Um, but that really freed up all the space. So there's a lot of room now around the turret to work, which had to happen before the next phase could take place. So doing our, our little pivot again, um, getting back into the condenser. So in our earlier, um, early in the presentation, we talked about way back in 2008, 2009, we took apart the um, the, uh, the uh, part started taking apart. We took the manifold pipe off. Now we want to get the two side pumps off the condenser. So that bilge and boiler feed, but there was this cross head in the way that connected the two together. So once again, we had to build a custom rig that enables to concentrate at the end of this piston rod while this device pulled this way. And so we're able to direct the load at the end of the piston, pull the cross head off without affecting the rest of the machine. And then that enabled us to then take the two side pumps, use our bridge crane in the lab, pick them up slightly, unbolt them from the side of the condenser, set them down into a custom frame in their existing orientation, but then a platform locked into the side parallel with the feet. And then we rotated the whole thing to basically take the pump off, down, turn it over and set it down. And so that was just a ton of work just to do that to get the pumps off. And so then they are now being the goal. And again, the goal for taking it apart is not only is it the desalination, but it's also now these are in some more manageable chunks. I use the word chunks, but components, there's a better word for it. Um, uh, and so that, that can be worked on independently. You don't have to drain a giant tank to work on something. So this has happened in 2019. And then in 2020, we're back to the guns. So the guns had largely been deconcreted from all the marine growth on the exterior but the gun, the bores of both guns were full of marine growth. Luckily, we knew they weren't loaded. And that's always a thing that you want to know. Um, it's very important, um, but how do you do that? 
These are the largest marine guns ever bored. Um, very, uh, and so we, we ran into a challenge is that there's three different patent drawings for the, uh, the bore shape of, a, of an 11 inch Dahlgren. We were very fortunate that Naval History and Heritage Command, which just so happens to have their storage facility nearby, happens to have one of the guns, had the guns from the USS Kearsarge, and one of them also happened to be an 11 inch Dahlgren from a, uh, um, from West Point Fondra where these were made. And so we were able to measure the profile of the back of the gun and uh, determine what um, specific shape and of the bore was, because as I go to the next slide, the back had this sort of reducing shape. And so here you can see we built a giant horizontal boring lathe to bore all that marine growth out. And there you go. So it took a, a lot of planning effort. It took almost a year of work, over a year, just to plan that operation, which we did in over the course of two days. And so that, again, is the challenge of the project is a lot of planning, a lot of research, a lot of figuring it out, because you only get one shot at it. Unfortunately, no cat. The only thing we found on the guns was one bolt. How it got there probably fell off during the wrecking. Um, we also, in, that, in um, 2020, finished the uh, port gun carriage, which is on display. And then that brings us now back to 2021 and the condenser. So you can see, it looks a lot different from when it was being loaded in the laboratory. So our next big step was taking the bed plate off the top. So we had to do a little bit more cleaning on it, but our big challenge with everything else, once again, is, all right, we gotta get the bed plate off, it's upside down, we gotta turn it over, how do we do that? And so it's coming up with a design, coming up with a plan, and in this case, our go-to for a lot of stuff is being built, basically building a roll cage. Get around it, pick it up, roll it over, take the cage apart. So you're basically, your support system not only has to be for picking up, but also has to, has to end up being its final stand at the same time, which is a lot of measurement, a lot of fitting, a lot of figuring out. And um, part one, what's in, enjoy. All right, I've got it off, and I'm going to turn it over, and this is the Swedish jam, I'll just say. First time that's been right side up in 160 years. And the last part we had to do with the condenser in this phase was to be able to get it out of the tank and get it on its side. And so once again, like everything else, everything needs to also have a custom frame and custom system. So we have to be able to design it so that it can pick it up and turn it and set it back down. Nice. <laughs> Thank you.
So let's talk about some next steps. I, I, in the past, I used to give dates, but now I don't. <laughs> um, we're really, it's, it's fine. The project's really been a lot of like, let's move the ball, let's move the ball. Nothing seems to be happening, nothing seems to be happening. And then it just, it all of a sudden happens rather quickly. And we're kind of at that precipice for a bunch of stuff. We're almost done with conservation of all the bulkhead structure, skeg assembly. Um, one of the Worthington pumps is almost completely done with conservation. We're now, part of the reason why we have the tank now um, drained is we're starting to lay the plan for starting the first phase of disassembly on the propulsion engine. The Dolphin guns are basically done with treatment. We're currently working on um, figuring out the best approach you want to do to dry them and to coat them. And so this is all starting discussions which we'll get to a little bit on how do you want to display them. And then we're also beginning the phases to understand about how to basically turn the turret over. So it's a lot going on that we have to figure out how to phase within the next couple of years. But stuff's happening, people. Uh, you know, it's, when we say it's 20 years, I hope that you see from the presentation it's just a lot that you're trying to juggle and figure out and we're in it's it's just it is a team effort for sure and um i think the last thing slide i'll show is these are some renditions um as i said earlier about the amount of the engine room that we have that was recovered i mean it's incredible what was brought up almost the entirety of it was i mean this is just an initial preliminary sketch but just to show you what there's flooring that's still here. There's other components. The engines are still here, but it's pretty much the whole part of the ship. And we hope that someday in some form that you all and everybody going forward will be able to stand where Lincoln stood and the crew stood looking at the engine in that perspective. And it's funny and not funny, but like it's interesting and it shows the importance of the capacity of the project. When I didn't talk to John about this presentation, John didn't talk to me about this presentation, but we ended up on the same quote at the end. And I think the importance of it is, you know, and we've said it before, is that the interesting thing about Monitor is that it, it really is about bringing people together. Like, that's the ship's legacy. If you think about it, it took, during its construction, it took people from Baltimore, from Buffalo, from all over New York, from the Hudson River Valley to come together to build the ship. Then it took a crew from all over, different nationalities, or places of origin, ethnic backgrounds, you know, areas of the country all coming together. It took a team to find the ship. It took a team to bring it up, bring it here. And now it's taking a team to conserve it and other partners. So I think that really makes this quote so fitting because it all boils down to the goal of why everyone, those in this room and everyone was here yesterday and involved is to be able to tell the stories of the crew. And so um, we thank everybody who was involved with bringing the stuff, bringing it to here. And thank you for listening. And I have to remember to say, I'll take questions if anyone has any. All right, thank you very much for listening. So we will be taking questions now. So if you have a question, just raise your hand. Um, I'll come to you with the mic. And I'll do my best to get everyone. All right. <laughs> Hello, my name's Jim. I was just wondering how much of the ship remains on the sea floor to be picked up. To be picked up? I don't know much. Um, do you want to talk about what's what's down there, John? How much did we deliver to the museum? Two, 200 210 tons? tons ish. Yeah, and she was almost a thousand tons displacement. So, oh, you know, we got. 80% of the ship is still there. Yeah. But I guess uh, for me as an archeologist and historian, the, the thing that I most wanna see is us to get back down and get into the places forward. You know, uh, the, the ship that has been described here, there's a bulkhead right in the middle that divides it from machinery space and living space is sort of half and half. And we've done almost nothing forward where all the officers and crew live and where all the, the supplies and, and war materials were, were stored. And so uh, I, I think it's so difficult working out there. I don't know that we're gonna get back anytime soon, but there's so many stories yet to be told by excavating up forward. And uh, I think the one good thing is that we could do a lot of work up there without overburdening the lab, you know, we'd be bringing up 
smaller objects, but, uh, but you, you don't really want anything right away, I think. <laughs> All right, thanks, John. All right, we have another one over here. Hi, is there a technical reason you're maintaining the turret upside down as it sat in the water for 140 years, or are you just respecting history? It's, it's big and heavy. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, the goal will be to turn it over and write it. it, will, it the goal will be to get it back in its correct orientation. It's just in phase and planning. As I said, we couldn't even entertain that idea really until since the last three years because the lower recovery structure was in the way. And so that's the next phase we'll be getting it over right. Um, and so that, that way we can, how that exactly happens is still in the works, but it, it's to get it in its correct orientation. Same thing with the rest of the machinery to get everything turned back over. Okay, thank you. Hi, I actually have a two part question. Um, did you encounter any rough weather uh, in the excavation process? And what is the typical size of a crew that you use for excavation of this, on this project? Um, I wasn't involved with the excavation, so um, that we basically, res well, that's not true. We, when materials that, that gotten here, we have continued some excavation work, but the actual recovery project, we are a, a public-private partnership. So in the sense that the excavation work was all done through the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration and the Navy, and we are charged with conservation curation display. So we work closely with the, our, our NOAA partners, but I can't really speak to that um, unless, once again, John, do you want to mention that? Because I don't know if he came to the earlier lecture. The, the short answer is yes. <laughs> you, you just can't work off batteries without running into bad weather. And it was, it was something we constantly had to factor in to all the work. There were several instances where we needed a really calm day to make some uh, make the next step, and the weather flew for days and days on end. So it's a really tough place to work. And uh, the Navy uh, has told me over the years that even with today's modern steel hulls, warships, they still get a battery supply of Earth because of the bad weather there. So that was always a factor. All right, up here. On the uh, conservation and preservation of things like the, the Worthington pumps, uh, are the toler tolerances now that they're conserved such as they would operate? I'm not saying you'd run them, but. Unfortunately, no, because as I said, mo pretty much anything that was a machinery component was made of cast iron. And so it's the alloy. So we have made, I didn't have any picture of this presentation, but we did make a full scale replica of one of the Worthington's operational from the, uh, using laser scans of the original components. But unfortunately, none of the original parts are gonna move again, just because they're kind of frozen in their last moment because they've de -alloyed. So typically um, with museum artifacts, you're not gonna run them um, because that's, that imply that you create new wear and so that's why most museums and even our, we do have utility collections that can be used because you don't want to you don't want to create that continued wear. So um, not to say that anything like the components will still be able to move potentially, but they would not be able to operate, or we would never attempt to operate them. Thank you. On components that you've pulled up, how do you know and declare that it's ready for display? Like how, as the, that process happens, where is that, okay, it's ready? So that's a, a, a D all the above kind of question. It's, it's got a lot of facets. Um, so one standpoint is desalination as far as we're gonna go. Um, so, you know, seawater is in thousands of parts per million. We want to get down to less than 2% parts per million chloride consistently. And then it's like, so it's like, is the chloride level as low as possible for a long for a protracted period of time? Are we going to take it apart as far as possible? We can't go any further. Um, and then you kind of make your decision. Everything in marine conservation is risk benefit analysis, right? Because for example, if you say, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be as aggressive, and I don't be aggressive like, like wailing on it, but like if you're not going to be as interventive now, you move out the gallery and make her in the gallery and still break on you. So it's that risk of, do I attempt it now with a potential risk, 
with a controlled manner or do I attempt it later on and, and, and it's happened in an uncontrolled manner and you kind of have to figure it out. And there's not necessarily a right answer because then it's uh, the way the way we try to work in the lab is a three part. It's, it's sort of the three pillars of, of sort of marine conservation with treatment is there's desalination. Um, there's surface coatings. Once you've dried it, you can put a protective layers on it to protect it from moisture. And then the third one is museum environment. Right. And so it's trying to keep it in a very dry environment post conservation. You're hoping the three of those things working together will inhibit future corrosion. But there, there are the only way to really know that you've got all the chloride out of a metal object is to do what's called a chemical digestion. You actually take a sample, you dissolve it, you, you filter out the chloride, and then you do an analysis. And so you could do that on an object to get an idea, but that's one location. You've got a massive turret. You know, you're all, and you're only sampling from the outside. You're doing a structure test, and so so you have to just basically say, this is what we think is the best it's going to get, and this is what we're going to go with based on the evidence that we have. And that's really all you can do. And again, no two projects are the same. We're kind of in a different directory than our friends at the Hunley are. There's, and you know, it's, it's just different. You just have to make based on on what the materials are telling you and what you can do with them. Okay, we'll take this last question, and then we will wrap up. Getting back to the turret and everything, so you've got the supports loose underneath it now, and you yes, took sir. out the uh, structure that you'd had underneath there to support it. Do you plan now to take out the panels? Because I, I figured before you flip it, you might get the panels so off. You, there's, a, there's an answer either way with that. So in some ways, you're, if, to, if you were to take the roof off while it's upside down, you, there, there are ways and that's been a consideration, but then you've, you've got four feet and then how do you get out from the turret? Um, you can yeah. only go through the door. So you have, you, have, yeah. you have gravity working with you, but then you also have control, uncontrolled scenarios. Now, if you turn it over, you're you now up high, okay. but you have more access to the crane. Yeah. And so then it's, can the turret hold the rotation of the turn, um, which yeah. we think it can um, based on the sur survivability, the, how the rod iron has survived, but it's still kind of TBD of what we're gonna do. Yeah, okay. And then it's working with people who know more about it than we do <laughs> from an engineering standpoint. Well, thank you all for coming out. I'd like to give another round of applause to Will and his conservation team. <laughs> and I can float for a minute if people still have questions, but if, if not, enjoy the museum in the day. Thank you for coming once again.